Good morning. Today I'll be reading Luke 1, verses 76 to 80. And it says, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord and prepare his ways, to give knowledge of the salvation to his people, by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God, which with the day spring from which on high was visited us to, to give light to those who sit in the darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So the, so the child grew and became strong in the spirit and was in the desert till the day of his manifestation to Israel. Thank you, Zach. You guys sound great today. Singing is really good. Glad to have you back, Gabby. Good job. Good job. Wow. It's a pleasure to be able to worship here and just to be able to join in with all of you. Let me give you a couple of things to begin with. If you're not aware and you have a kid in the village, uh, next Saturday is going to be a party for the kids who are in the village. I think it's kindergarten to fifth grade, but you have to sign up today. Okay, if you haven't signed up already. So back at the Welcome Center, make sure you do that. Also next Sunday, the elders are going to come and they are going to talk about the plan for Mesa and all of them are going to be involved in the service. All of them are going to be singing. All of them are going to be speaking. Bring a lunch. <laughs> no, that's not right. I mean, they, they will all be here and it will be a great day of worship and uh, a great time to be able to realize what we're doing as you hear from your leaders because they have a lot of great things to be able to say to you and the things that they're thinking, the things that they're planning. I will not be here next week, not because the elders are speaking, <laughs> but this is going to sound bad, I guess. Just to take advantage of that time, and I don't know if you are aware or not, but my sister still lives in Anchorage, Alaska, and the earthquake two weeks ago uh, flooded her place. The pipes broke in the apartment above. She has had to completely move out. They've got to completely redo some things, and so she needs some help getting this whole thing to work and back together. So I'm going to go up there for the rest of the week. I'm flying out tomorrow, and... Uh, I will be with her trying to figure out how to fix whatever she's broke. So that's where I'm, what my week's going to be, not exactly vacation. I don't know if you have been in this position. Where do you sit this morning? Does it feel like this, like you're just sitting there all by yourself? Uh, it's not in a group. It's not in the middle of anything. You're just kind of out there, and it's not such a good day. I hope not. I hope you've been able to come here and feel like this is the greatest place and you're able to be in the presence of God and able to be with other Christians and able to join in with them and it's just one of those things that's amazing for you. The story of Zechariah and John, John the Baptist, is an amazing story. There has been no word from God for 400 years at all. 400 years, that's a long time. That's longer than America has been in existence. In fact, if you start thinking back, that's going to be 1618. The King James Bible came out in 1611. It's the first real English version that was widely distributed. It still is today. There were other versions that were English before that, but not a lot before that. And so it's the first time when you have that. In 1607, I believe it is, the first settlement in America that was English, Jamestown, began. Plymouth Rock would not exist for another two years. And if God has not spoken since the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock, would you believe He's going to speak. That is a long time of silence. 400 years with no word from God. When they know God gives to prophets, when they know God speaks from mountains, when they know God sends his word, and now nothing. 
I mean, just three or four days in your house, if your wife won't speak to you, you might begin to think something's wrong, right? <laughs> if it goes on for two weeks, you might definitely know that something's wrong, and by then you need to start asking, well, what did I do or what happened here? But God hadn't said anything for 400 years. This is a long time. And so from where they sit, 400 years of complete darkness, and suddenly Zechariah goes to the temple. He's a priest. He offers the sacrifice. The angel Gabriel appears to him, and he says, you're going to have a son. And he talks about the nation of Israel, and he talks about how God is their God, and God is going to lead them. And that their child is going to be a prophet, that he's going to give them the knowledge of salvation, the forgiveness of sins, and that he's going to be a light to those who sit in darkness. What an incredible prophecy. After no word at all for 400 years, all of a sudden, not only as he's older and thinking, I'm not having any children, now he's going to have a child who's going to be the spokesman that God will speak through to his nation for the first time in that long. That's got to be incredible. And he simply asked the question, well, uh, how is this going to be? And God essentially says, shut up. I'm not going to let you talk anymore. And he can't speak until John is born. And then they call him John instead of Zechariah. But he's going to give a light to those who sit in darkness because that's where they are. That's where they sit. And suddenly this child is going to be born and they have had so many things happen since then. They have been captured by Babylonians. They have been captured by Greeks. They have been captured by Persians. They now have been captured by Rome. And God has not said a single thing in all that time. That's a lot of captivity. That's a lot of lost wars. That's a lot of things that have gone wrong in their life. And now a baby's going to be born. And his name's going to be John. And he's the one who's going to bring the message of God. Would you believe in God after that much time? Would you really know that God's going to be able to do this? Sometimes we where we start believing in God makes a huge difference. And when that happens, it's amazing to think about. I think that's what maybe the problem with Israel as we look at how they came out of Egypt. I mean, they got there because of a famine, but then there's 400 years there also. The time between the time they went down and then 400 years until God sends Moses. Captivity has happened to them. They've lost their children. All the male boys around Moses' age are gone. They were all killed. Wow. There's been a lot of prayers that have been offered for this captivity, for this time when they're, they're basically being slaves. They didn't do anything wrong, and so they pray to God, and they wonder when God's going to deliver and from that vantage point, sometimes it's really hard to believe in God. And when Moses leads them out, they get to the Red Sea, and he says, here's the salvation of God. They say, we're done. Because they can't believe anymore. And they get past the Red Sea with a great amazing miracle, as well as all the plagues, and they get to where there's no water, and they say, we're done. We might as well go back and be killed because they can't imagine that God would ever deliver them. And they get past the water as it comes out of a rock and they get, well, we don't have any food. And so then they get food and they say, but there's no meat. My wife blames me for that. She says, men are always like that. <laughs> and that may have been true back then. And so that's the complaint. Well, there's no meat, so there's nothing to eat. And God says, fine, I'll give you meat. But it's one complaint after another after another. And I think maybe the place where they come from is so far down that they can't believe in God anymore. 
or that God's really going to deliver them. They get to the edge of the promised land. They say, no, we can't take this. After all the miracles they'd seen from God, after there being a prophet of God sitting right in their midst, after there being a tent of meeting where they watch God physically come down, where they see the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud, and they say, no, we don't think God can do it. Really? How depressed do you have to be before you get to that stage? That's really something, isn't it? And I don't think then it's any surprise that we have people in that kind of shape today. Maybe they haven't been through quite that much, but I think we run into people all the time. And I think we see that in the time of Jesus, that people sit in darkness. Do you believe that God answers prayer? Do you believe that that's going to work? Can God act on what's impossible for right now and that he's going to make a difference Or maybe as your situation hardens you to the power of God. As we look at Jesus, when he comes in, he comes in and he talks to so many people and he heals so many people. And it's really amazing the way he does. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9 says, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. Very simple story. I mean, here's Matthew. He's at the tax booth. His parents have got to be proud of him, right? He's collecting taxes, but they're not for his government. They're for some other government. In fact, his parents are probably ashamed of him, and no one in town likes him anymore because to collect taxes at that time, Rome just said, we want our taxes, and we're not going to pay you. You just collect whatever you want. As long as we get our part, you can collect anything. And they were known to be cheats. And they were known to collect extra. Well, that's how they got paid. And so they were known to gouge people who didn't have the money in the first place. They're working for the captors. No one likes them. You can't really get in a worse place than that. No one likes you at all. You're hated by all your, well, friends and family probably because you're taking their money away to pay for something that is corrupt that is enslaving you and where is God can anybody save me from this and then Jesus walks along and maybe for a moment he believes something can be better But I can imagine him being in that place and going, you know what, it's never going to change. It's never going to get any better. It's never going to do any good. But that's not Matthew. Matthew believes. We're in Matthew chapter 9. There's the story of Jairus, first of all. It says in verse 18, while he was sitting, saying these things with them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him saying my daughter has just died and come but come and lay your hand on her and she will live and Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples and behold a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment for she said to herself if I only touch his garment I will be made well there's a lot of tragedy in this have you ever been sick Well, there's a lot of it going around, and uh, I'd venture to say you've been sick. Have you ever been seriously sick? Have you been through an operation? Have you been hospitalized? Do you know what it's like to feel so helpless that you can't get better for right now, and people have got to cut parts off of you or, or put stuff in you or sew stuff back together before you can be okay, and you pray to God? His daughter's dead. How do you get out of that? Can Jesus rescue a daughter who's just died? But he believes in that. He's been praying to God. And it drives him to Jesus. Maybe that's it. I'm not going to say that's why it happens. But it does drive him to Jesus. And he believes if Jesus comes and touches her, she can be healed. But before he can do that, there's a woman who's been on her period for 12 years. 
She spent everything she has. She's been to every doctor she can find, and there's not a single person who's able to help her at all. And yet she has faith. She believes if I just go and touch Jesus' coat, all I have to do is that. I don't even have to disturb him. If I can just touch his coat, I'll be healed. Twelve years. Of course, both of these work. I mean, she does come and she does cut his coat and she is healed. And then Jesus does go to Jairus' house and raises his daughter from the dead. What an amazing thing Jesus is able to do as he answers some of the most difficult places in life that people could ever be. I imagine the woman had prayed a lot. And God had been silent 12 years. Can you imagine the pain you have now for 12 years? Would you still be praying as fervently? Would you still believe God could do something? Would you still be sure? There's blind men that sit by the road. When they hear Jesus is coming by, they cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy. Can anyone heal a blind man? You see, these people all still have hope, and yet somehow we get to places in a lot of times that we don't really believe we can be healed. What if it was 12 years before you could be healed? Or 400? I mean, that's a... Well, never mind. I think there's a difference between where people get to today and what Jesus does. And we seem to run up against this because we don't really have that much crisis. When you're used to dealing with crisis and used to dealing with tragedy, the little things don't seem so bad. I mean, I had a car wreck. Well, there was an earthquake that totaled the house. Well, there's an army who came and took the house away from you. And you're now in jail. And you get beaten every day. You're not going to worry about the car wreck. That seems small compared to all the rest of the stuff that you have going on. And yet I think today, because we don't have as much trouble or crisis around us, and yet that's not to say that we don't, people seem to find that it seems as if it's huge. And when there's a difference between life and what Jesus has, and that difference gets too great, we're going to lose one or the other. I think for my story, that happened to me fairly early. I was involved in church. We went to church. When I first started, my dad was the preacher until I was 12. And after that, no, he wasn't the preacher, but he was one of the elders. And so I was involved in church. I understood church. I knew church. I was comfortable there. I wasn't as comfortable in school. And so other public situations and places like that, eh, those kind of bother me a little bit more. And so most of my friends are in church and most of the people I know are in church. And so somehow, is it any surprise, my career gets connected with church and I start thinking about it that way because after all, that's the place kind of where my life has centered from the very beginning because that's the way my parents taught me. And if you don't develop that other side and get out and see all these other things, where are you going to tend to stay inside? And, I, you know, that's part of where I am and part of who I am. But for some people, the life in the world is so different from Jesus that I think they have a hard time really believing it's true. We come and we talk about love and grace and mercy and forgiveness and the kindness of God. And when they walk out of here, I should have been clicking all of these. When they walk out of here, they go home to this. And they live with that all week long. That's their husband, that's their roommate, that's their brother, that's somebody in their family that is a huge influence in their life that they cannot get away from, and that's his good day. 
how easy is it then to believe in grace? And sometimes I think we run into situations like this that are so difficult that it's hard for us to even imagine the concept. And that's who we're trying to reach. That's who we're trying to share the gospel with. And we say, no, it's easy. Just come to church, sing the song, and everything will be good. And they can't even grasp it. I know when I come, I sit and... It's completely disconnected. They can't make any crossover between Christian living and the world that they live in simply because it's not their world. Nobody's nice in the world. Nobody's kind in their world. Everybody is out for themselves. It's all about control. And you look at Hebrews 11 and all those great people of faith and nobody in their life has faith. Everybody in their life is angry and doubtful and full of revenge and hatred and It's so difficult to say, yes, let's be a person who is full of joy and rejoice in the Lord. And sure, you've got examples of people who do that in the middle of their persecution, but for them, it's so difficult. And you've got to imagine where they sit. Or maybe the problem is not just that, but the problem is their addictions. I love the sign. It's honest. Need money for drugs. Right? Because that's what he's going to spend it on. And he can't imagine life without that. I've got to have that because I've, I've had to escape. I can't stand reality. I've had to escape. I've had to get out of my life. And now I have no other choice. And it's got to be really hard to think that Jesus could do that. Can Jesus? Absolutely he can. We've got people sitting in the audience today where it has happened. It has worked. If this is you, please don't give up on this because absolutely it works. Or maybe the person is homeless. That's a trap. Goodness. I mean, sometimes they're homeless because of difficult circumstances and it just came upon them and they wanted people to take care of them and and it just didn't work. But a lot of times they're homeless because they don't want to follow the rules. I don't want to get a job. I don't want to work for anybody. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. And I'm just going to be honorary against all authority, against all people who would be, and I'm going to just take care of myself and do whatever I want. And they are. And life becomes more about survival than about singing songs of grace. And it's really hard to think of spiritual things when you're trying to figure out how to heat a can of beans. Or maybe it's the trap of being a victim. Broken things and broken people are a result of sin. God sent his son to be broken that we might be healed, but sometimes the person who's a victim, they're not really aware that they did anything wrong. We just wanted someone to take care of us, and rather than taking care of us, they came and took advantage of us, and they took everything away from us. And someone is always taking things from us. And we don't like it when people come and say, oh, I want to be your friend. And we don't trust that. Are you kidding me? The last people who have done that have stolen everything from us. And so we just need to protect ourselves and we're suspicious of everything. And certainly we're suspicious of a God who would leave us in that place. Or there's a person who's a workaholic. And he feels like he needs to take care of everything. Nobody does this as good as I do, and so I need to be on charge. And if God would just make this a perfect world, then I wouldn't have to work so much. But nobody else is competent. Nobody else is good. And so I can't really believe in a God who forgives people who intentionally sin. Really? we got to have a better world than that. Or maybe it's because they grew up outside the church and... They have no clue what goes on in here. Not an idea. If you walk in, you, they talk about, we don't even know what. They use a different language like sanctification. What kind of a word is that? We, don't, we never even heard that word before. And so everything feels like it's not normal. And they don't want to look stupid, so 
And not only that, but they've seen a lot of unchristian attitudes and they've seen a lot of the news reports and they can tell you every bad thing that's happened in every church that has hit every news story and they're all the same, right? You assume every single church is guilty of every single thing every group has ever done. Why would they trust God? The last one is maybe the baggage of growing up in church, which I did. But you see a lot of unchristian attitudes among the flock. There are a lot of times where you're not sure Christianity really took and they're kind of pretenders and kind of fakes and they're kind of here just to sit in the pew and they're going to be here and they're going to say stuff and it's going to sound all good. But boy, if you ever see them out of here, that's not the same person. And we expected it would be more and we expected better and a lot of people are walking away going, you know what, that's not right. Well, there's less cussing as long as the preacher's around, right? Maybe less violence. I would say less anger, but I'm not really sure that's the case. Less victimizing. But there's a lot of control people. This is where authority starts, isn't it? Starts with God. God's the first one who tells you what to do, and everybody else from then on is telling you what to do. And it's, eventually you get tired of it. And each one of these sees the world differently. And each one of these has their own baggage. And each one of these comes with a special difficulty of trying to reach into Jesus. So from where I sit, do you find yourself being able to believe in God? I don't know if any of those stories are you. I hope you grew up in a perfect family with perfect society around you and everybody treated you nice and right and everybody in church was nice and right and there are none of these issues that you've ever run into. But I'd venture to say you have. And the reason for the sermon, just so you know, is I've seen people who struggle with this very thing. Grown up in church all their life. And somehow where they find themselves in the world does not seem like reality with church. Their world is so cruel, how can church in an hour take away all the cruelty they've experienced all week? It's pretty difficult, isn't it? To believe in a God of grace when they've seen so much. To believe that God does this. But that's what I want you to know today. God works in every single place. Because all of the stories I've told you have happy endings. Every single one of them has a happy ending. Now, sometimes the people couldn't accept it, like Israel, as they came out of Egypt. They couldn't accept their good fortune. They couldn't accept the giving them a new land and how somebody took care of them for 40 years and all of the blessings that God gave them. They're like, no, it can't be true. No, it can't be true. I hope you never find yourself in that place. But there's a lot of times where people do. And sometimes the ch it's the choices we've made that put us where we are. And some of those choices were accidents and we didn't mean to and we never thought we'd end up here. And some of those choices were on purpose. And we did them to ourselves. And now here we are and we're having to pay the consequences. Maybe it's because there was no better option. Maybe it's just because... We wanted what we wanted at the time we wanted it. But the good news is that God works in every place. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul is writing. Paul's the guy who grew up in church around religion. He was a Pharisee. He grew up around Pharisees. He knows all about Pharisees. He thought it was right. He thought it was good to the point that it was so right, he was persecuting Christians. He was the guy throwing them in jail. He was the guy coming to get them. He was the guy destroying families in the name of God. You think bad things don't happen in the name of God? All the time. 
And Paul comes from that, and he is rescued, becomes face-to-face with Jesus. It's got to be one of the most amazing incidents because Jesus has to blind him to get his attention. And he leaves him that way for three days. He says, what are you doing? Well, that's what I want to ask you today is where do you sit? And what are you doing with it? What do you do about it? Listen to what Paul says in this passage in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. With ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts, giving the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Do you realize what he's saying? He's saying to every person who's had tragedy and finds themselves sitting in tragedy, wondering if God will answer after 12 years or after 400 years, or after whatever period of time, and it just seems impossible. He says, light shown. And I'm here to tell you the story. When you share Jesus, that's what you share. Share that Jesus shines in a broken life. Paul doesn't try to hide that. He writes it three times about his conversion. Here's what happened. And God had to really work to get my attention to make me believe that something could be different there. He says, we go through all these struggles. We are afflicted, perplexed, and persecuted. And don't let that stop you because there is a God who works in all of those situations. There is a God who is powerful in everything that has happened to you and can bring you out and who can deliver you to a place of grace. He says we are jars of clay, but the emphasis is not on the fact that we are jars. The emphasis is on the fact that there is a treasure inside of the jar. There is light that shines out of the jar. The treasure is inside and we aren't ever going to have it all together. We aren't ever going to have total security. We aren't ever going to be a perfect church. There's not ever going to be a time where you don't run into people who are sinners inside and outside the church. But we gather together as people who are forgiven, as people who have the grace of God. And Jesus calls us as jars of clay to let his light shine. We don't have to be better here and get life figured out here. But we can be better where he is. It isn't the pot that matters, it's the light. And we're just the pot. So quit focusing on ourselves and on our situation and on how difficult it is and on how hard it is and look at what God is able to do. Be able to see this glorious light that God has as he comes into a person's life and fills him with grace. And we can have the light of the glory of God as it shines. That's the message. Stop focusing on your your life and see that there's this great God who's created and who still creates and who still forgives and who still has grace. And it's all open to you. Don't sit there with your problem going, yeah, but my life's been hard. Whose hasn't? And God uses that to say, you know what? My light really shines in a dark place like yours. If you don't have that light, it's time you did. If you need to come, come while we stand and sing.